the, the mission of the computer vision platform is to enable our partners to implement the next generation enterprise AI solutions. And this focus on the enterprise has led in the last few years to significant breakthroughs of application of AI across multiple verticals. Industries are using our technology to detect damage in their facilities for predictive maintenance. Me and entertainment companies are using our technology to implement intelligent content management systems. And the focus of this talk, healthcare organizations and labs are using our technology to analyze medical imagery to optimize radiology and pathology workflows. So a few examples of this, the brain team has been using computer vision to detect diabetic retinopathy, uh, leveraging fundus images, or images from the back of the eye. Now, this is critical work and a significant breakthrough because diabetic retinopathy is one of the leading and fastest growing causes for, for uh, blindness. If this disease is not being detected on time, it can lead to irreversible blindness. Now, the bad news is that there's not that many physicians in the world that can detect this disease on time, so it's very critical for us to empower these doctors with AI technology uh, so that we can prevent blindness. And this is especially true in, in underserved populations where there's not enough coverage of doctors. Another example is the work from our brain team who has been using computer vision algorithms uh, on top of tissue slides to detect different forms of cancer. This is also very critical work because detecting uh, cancer in these sort of slides can take multiple hours from physicians and requires multiple years of training. And to explain why, uh, one single slide uh, has, is immensely large and, and has over one uh, gigapixel of, of resolution. So it's also very critical for us to help those doctors detect and analyze these images uh, to improve different patient outcomes. Now, these two use cases can be implemented with our computer vision tooling today, uh, which, to recap, is comprised of two sets of products. Our pre-trained products, or the Vision API, and our customizable products called AutoML Vision. Our pre-trained products require no training. They're completely plug and play into your code. You can just simply issue a REST call to be able to get predictions from your data. And these are great for generic and well-understood use cases. And our AutoML Vision product can be customized with your own data, uses behind the scenes Google state-of-the-art neural architecture search and hyperparameter tuning technology. And this is great for more specialized use cases. Now, last year, we introduced AutoML Vision for image classification. And we're very humbled by the popularity and success of this tool, but we know that this is only part of the toolkit required to do computer vision, especially as we tackle more complex healthcare scenarios. So for that reason, I'm very excited to announce AutoML Vision Object Detection. This product allows you to detect not only the presence, but the location, body box coordinates of objects in your images. And this whole experience is, is very seamless, and it, it has the same model quality as the rest of the AutoML product family. And to explain how to use this technology in a real use case, I'm inviting Ben Litchfield, Software Development Manager from IDEX, on stage. Come on. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Ben Litchfield, and I've been working at IDEX about 13 years developing software solutions, uh, specifically in the diagnostic imaging space. Our mission at IDEX is to improve the health and well-being of pets, people, and livestock. And what I mean by that is we sell diagnostic equipment that uh, detects uh, diseases in pets. Uh, we sell this equipment uh, to about 20,000 different veterinary hospitals worldwide. Uh, so if you have uh, a cat or dog that you've brought into the veterinary practice and had a test run, it's probably been on our equipment. We also do testing in dairy, uh, poultry flocks, and other livestock animals. Uh, we have a, a, an amazing water business where our tests are used to improve the health of drinking water for two and a half billion people every single day. Those tests are used on all seven continents 
in submarines below the sea and in the International Space Station in outer space. At IDEX, we love our pets, and uh, the white cat up there is my cat, Nilla. Um, so we always try to include them in our presentations uh, that we do. Uh, that's a picture of her uh, hanging out in our cabin in the northern Maine woods. So like I said, we, our primary focus is around veterinary diagnostic equipment. And um, a few years ago, we started to invest heavily in machine learning technology, specifically around imaging. And I want to talk about a few of these different products that we have. The top left is a set of you uh, device. Uh, this analyzes raw urine and takes microscopic images of the urine. And then we use machine learning to detect elements within that. So that's things like red blood cells, white blood cells, and a variety of different types of crystals that you can see in urine. We have 250 million images uh, from veterinary practices in our cloud right now. We're on our fourth major uh, iteration of our machine learning model. The last model, uh, we added the ability to detect a very rare crystal that we had to use machine learning to sort of analyze our data set to find data to build up our training set to, to, to release that. We have hematology devices. Um, we also have a, a pathology scanner. This generates about two petabytes of imagery every single year that we can analyze. We have radiology. I'll talk a little bit about that more later. We also sell an ECG device. We bundle that with a subscription service for veterinary practices. This is frequently used uh, for screenings before surgeries, uh, where a lot of cases are sort of normal hearts. They want to know that the pet is healthy enough to go under surgery. So we use technology to automatically read those. If it's normal, we'll send that result automatically back to the practice. If it's abnormal, we'll have a cardiologist read it. Cardiologists love this feature because reading normal ECGs all day long is very boring. They want to be able to focus their efforts on uh, more interesting cases. The other device we sell is a snap kit. These are kits that we sell, we've sold for a long time. And essentially, what they do is they, uh, detect diseases in cats and dogs, things like Lyme disease or heartworm. And it's a snap kit because uh, you put some fluid in there, um, uh, blood serum, and then you snap it. And that result takes a few minutes to show up. And then it's only valid for so long. So what we did is we developed this device, the Snap Pro Reader, where the veterinary technician can put the snap kit in. It will actually automatically snap it for them, set off a timer, and then take a picture of the window um, at the right time. It reads, it reads the dot on that to see if the, it's positive for any of the diseases, and then automatically imports that into our systems. We have a full suite of radiology uh, equipment. We, both, we sell both um, the, the, uh, the capture equipment. Uh, once you capture an image, that automatically goes up to our uh, Webpack's cloud system. We have 100 million radiographs there. Most veterinary practices have an x-ray capture machine, but they don't have a radiologist on site. So we also provide a service where practices can send us a radiograph, and we'll have radiologists read them for them. And then uh, finally, that report and the image will go back into their practice management uh, software automatically. So I want to drill in a little bit more into the telemedicine and workflow, which is where I see a lot of opportunity in uh, machine learning technology. A typical flow or a typical uh, radiologist uh, will have a couple monitors. On the first monitor, they'll have their, their case work list, um, where they have a list of all their cases they need to work on that day, some of the case details, and then um, an image viewer on monitors two and three, for example. But one of the things that they like to do is they were taught to read um, x-rays in a certain order. So for example, they like to see their thorax images first and their abdomen images next. Um, so they spend time at the very beginning organizing all their data, um, generally about 30 seconds for each case. And right now, we're at capacity. We have several hundred radiologists. And the only way we can really expand our business is by adding more radiologists or making their workflow more efficient. And we've really hired almost all the veterinary radiologists there are already. So one of the challenges is, is all of our images come in somewhat unorganized. Uh, they do have DICOM tags generally, but not always. Sometimes they're also wrong. In the veterinary uh, practice, the technicians that capture x-rays are not always highly trained. And it can be a, a real challenge sometimes to, to get a proper x-ray of a pet on the table. So they'll come in upside down, flipped, 
uh, sometimes with a title, sometimes that's blank. Um, so again, radiologists will spend that 30 seconds or so on every single case just organizing their images. So we spend over half a million dollars a year paying radiologists just to organize their images. So the obvious solution is to use machine learning technology to help, to help them and organize their data so that when they open up their case, their data is all organized automatically for them. We started looking at this uh, maybe last year or so, and uh, we started looking at whole image classification first. So can we take these images and just bucket them into high-level pieces of anatomy, for example, skull, thorax, abdomen, or, or extremity? And that works really well. It was very fast and easy to sort of train whole image uh, classification. Um, we did have a lot of data that was uh, labeled, so we kind of just put those all in folders. It was very easy to kind of set up the, the training and the labeling of this and, and build a model. Um, but one of the challenges we saw was we have a variety of images like this where it doesn't neatly fit into any single bucket. It's not just a skull or a thorax or an abdomen. It really has components of all of those. And because, again, uh, a lot of uh, veterinary technicians aren't highly trained, they might take images like this versus sort of just the, the focused anatomy. So this is where the object detection capability of AutoML comes in, where we can now detect uh, individual pieces of the anatomy and label them and know where they are. So with this, I can now take this image and say, well, the intention of this was a thorax. It's what's in the center of the image. They weren't intending to take a skull shot. It's on the edge uh, of the image. So our first pass of this was actually before object uh, detection in AutoML was available. So we hired uh, some temps and labeled all this data uh, and built tools uh, to do all this. And in reality, that cycle is very long. We built, our, we built our own labeling tool. We bundled that together with some TensorFlow models. We evaluated that. We gave that to some, some interns to label the data. And this whole process was many weeks to months long, to be honest. Because by the time you get that labeled data, look at it, analyze it, go look at which ones were, were incorrect, how do we, you know, getting good visualization of what's wrong and where it's going wrong um, without sort of an integrated tool like object uh, detection is a real challenge. So I want to show this to you uh, live, um, a demo of what we did with object detection in AutoML. So the first part um, that you do with object detection in AutoML is upload your data set. I'm going to skip this part today uh, just for time. Um, but generally, what you do is just load up your data into uh, Google Cloud Storage. You have the ability to either uh, upload labels yourself, uh, or you can use the labeling tool within uh, Google Auto Detection, um, depending on if you already have labels from another system. So for this example, we uploaded 15,000 images uh, and did about nine different classes. So the, the classes are over here, abdomen, uh, lateral, or in BD are sort of two different angles, uh, extremity, pelvis, you know, skull, and whatnot. This is what the labeling looks like. So over here is the skull, the thorax cavity, the abdomen, and a pelvis. And if I want to add another label, you just simply draw a box. It adds it as a new entry over here, and you pick what, what the label is. So it's really fast and easy to add labels uh, to, to your system. Once you've uploaded your data and you've labeled all your images, the next step is to train. This does take a few hours, so I'm not going to show this live. Um, but it's pretty simple. You just hit uh, train new model and then hit start training. Once your, once your model has been trained, you, then need to go you still need to go through an evaluation phase to evaluate it. What, what worked, what didn't work. Usually, I'll do that by looking at individual classes. You can look at all of them together. Um, but for example, if we look at Skull VDs, what it shows you first is your true positives. And what's really nice about this is just the visualization of this, this piece integrated into the tool. So the green box is the predicted uh, what the model predicted, 
and the gray box is what our ground truth is or what our, our human label is labeled at. It also shows false negatives. So this is areas where the model uh, failed to predict the correct bounding box. Bounding box detection is a little bit different than whole image classification because the bounding box that you labeled is not going to be exactly the same as the one the model predicted, you know, pixel for pixel. Uh, so Google and many other um, uh, libraries use uh, what's called intersection over union, which is, or essentially how much the two boxes overlap uh, for that. So in this example, these are ones that it's saying it wasn't really right, but in reality, just, it just didn't overlap enough. You do have the ability to come in here and change that threshold, so I can, I can lower that a little bit. That will raise our, our accuracy and sort of change, uh, change the results down here. The other thing I'll show you is the false positives. So where your human labeler said there was some, or didn't say there was something in there, but the model found something. And in reality, uh, in our example here, this is actually cases where the human label are missed, uh, missed a label, and we need to go fix, uh, fix these labels. Once you've gone through a couple cycles of the labeling and training, um, you automatically get a model deployed. It comes with some sample code, which is uh, simply a REST API, or you can use curl, or Python, or whatever language you want to use. Um, it also has a really simple uh, way to, to test your model on other data. So for example, here's uploading an image um, and predicting this. So that was done sort of on the fly. So the really nice part about this is all, none of these steps required any code. So you don't really need to be a data scientist or a developer to, to get a, a custom trained model on your own problem and a, a, a model deployed in the cloud, which is really awesome. You've taken sort of what we had before, which is weeks and months of effort, lots of development effort, to something that now maybe a business analyst could even do. Can we switch back to the slides? So just to summarize, AutoML significantly streamlined our process for this. Again, we went from, from weeks down to a couple of days to do this. Our focus is really not um, replacing radiologists, but how can we make them more efficient? How can we streamline their process um, and uh, make their work a little bit easier? One of the key pieces I do want to emphasize is trying to integrate machine learning models into their existing workflow. So as you think about sort of problems that you want to solve, what are ones that can be integrated into your other workflow and not be separate? If I have to leave the application that I normally use and go to someone else, or there's more steps to, to be able to utilize that model, um, that might not be a great uh, use case for machine learning. And then the other part to this is, th this is a simple example, but it has a big impact. This is going to save us half a million dollars every single year, and it's a project that now really takes only a couple days. Because of the variety of imaging equipment we have at IDEX, we really have hundreds of different types of problems we need to solve. And object, you know, auto ML is going to you know, make that a lot easier for us to solve these things. Cool. I am going to hand it off now back to Google. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Ben, uh, for the awesome use case and our great partnership together. Um, so now we're going to have Ari Mer. He's a product lead for the Cloud Haircut team. And he's going to give us the vision of Google uh, for, for healthcare in the cloud. Thanks, Francesco. Take it away. Thank you, folks. Um, so I think my colleagues have presented here how information is important in healthcare, and the value of information helps make better decisions. So I want to share a little story that kind of made me, brought me into the cloud healthcare team. So as Francesco mentioned, I'm a, a product manager within cloud healthcare, with a, a team within Google Cloud that's focusing on industry-specific cloud capabilities. And I'll talk a little bit more specific. So I, I happen to move apartments a couple of times over the last three years. And every time I move an apartment, I like to find a dentist that lives where I live. Like, I just like that convenience. And the, the thing is that when you go to a new dentist, the first thing they want to do, they want to give you a full x-ray of mouth, right? Now, so I don't know. I don't love that idea because I'm getting more radiation. The other thing is like I have to pay for it. Uh, so I ask the new dentist, is like, well, why don't you just connect to my old dentist, because I had my x-rays there like six months ago, and just like bring the information there. 
It's like, oh, I, I cannot connect. We're like on a different system. I was like, okay. So I decided before we do the x-ray, let me go to the old dentist and I'll take the x-ray on a CD, right? So I like found myself. He didn't have the CDs. I actually had to find a digital CD. Apparently they have this thing, medical grade CDs that cost 20 bucks a pop. It's like more expensive than the CD-ROM drive. And then I bring it, he burns it on this CD, and I bring it to my new doctor and says, I cannot take it. It's like, why not? It's like, well, it's a liability issue. Maybe somebody tampered with your pictures, and then uh, I, I cannot operate based on that. I can't make decisions. So it's like, OK. Like, so I got the extra dose of radiation. I had to pay for it because my insurance didn't cover more than one set of x-rays within six months. But it just made me think of like, how broken the system is in terms of IT or information flow in the healthcare space. The other little piece uh, I want to share with you is, is this article was written by a medical doctor and also a PhD in economics by the name of Anupam Jena. So this gentleman is a Harvard medical doctor. The only reason I mentioned that he's a PhD in economics is that we can kind of assume that he knows how to run, design and run an experiment. Right? And the experiment that he describes in this paper was very simple. So he noticed that in the US, there are 30,000 cardiologists. And once a year, 70% of them, or 21,000 out of the 30,000, go to this conference that takes a week. A week. So basically, 70% of arguably a very important doctor is out of their hospital, not seeing patients. Question is, what happens to these patients? Who thinks that the patients get better? Who thinks patients get worse? Well, the data shows that the patients actually get better. Mortality goes down when the doctors are away. And I'm bringing, you can read the details there, but it's kind of like makes you wonder what's going on here, right? I have some theories, but, but this data suggests that the decisions that are made in the context of healthcare systems are not optimized for necessarily for the benefit of the patients. And this is not the fault of any specific doctor. It's just like the incentives are complex, right? There is the payer, there is the provider, there is a patient. And sometimes it's not aligned with the benefit of, of the people it should serve. So as Google, we're trying to think, OK, we're definitely not coming from a place we can, oh, this will solve, like IT will solve all of this. But I think our strength is around organizing information. So we see our team's mission is kind of organize the world's healthcare information and help make better decisions, help our customers and our partners make, make better information, better decisions for healthcare. So what we do in cloud healthcare, we build tools that help ingest and manage information for healthcare, which means EHR data, medical imaging data, genomics data, dictation data, device data, and then enable providers, enable vendors, enable our partners and customers to develop applications on top of this data, like the one that you saw presented by IDEX, by Ben. So in this short talk, I want to give you like a little bit of a highlight of how we are thinking about our product development roadmap and where we are thinking of going with this mission. And the one way to slice it would be in, in three layers. So the first layer is the data platform layer. And I'll talk a little bit about this, but the idea here is that before you can use all of these cool tools like AutoML, like Cloud Machine Learning Engine, like Big Data Analytics, which is, for example, a tool like BigQuery, before you can use all of these tools, you need to organize your data in a way that allows you to use these tools effectively. Otherwise, as, as Ben mentioned, like the data comes and it's kind of in a mess. Sometimes the metadata is missing, sometimes the metadata is wrong, and it's very difficult to bring it to a normalized standard format. The other piece is once your data is in the cloud, what can you do with it? Like what are the types of cloud services that you can use so that you can focus your application on what really sets you apart? And then the last piece is the, the actual applications on top of it. So this is like three layers to, to think about our platform, and I'll go over in details each one about, about each one of them. So this is kind of a high level uber high level architecture slide that describes um, how a typical medical imaging can work um, in the context of a cloud. So you have some sort of a device that produces medical images. So on the left here, you see something that resembles an ultrasound. Now the data would be ingested into the cloud through a data layer platform product we have called Cloud Healthcare API. 
And then once the data is in the cloud, it can be normalized. It can be visualized using commercial or open source viewers. And it can be used for analysis or training of AI models. So if you think about it, what happens in a typical, this is an example from medical imaging world because we're talking about vision. What happens typically, the image is acquired, then it's being pre-processed, then it's being presented to the physician that makes the decisions, and then it's being archived. So these are the kind of the four, the different pieces represented here. And the other piece that's related to data is our effort around public data sets. So if you're a researcher, then typically what you're interested in doing is testing hypotheses. You might have a hypothesis that I have an algorithm idea to detect, let's say, kidney stones. I need a way to test this hypothesis effectively. And then once I test it, I want to be able to commercialize it. I want to be able to integrate it on a clinical workflow. So the first piece for testing hypotheses, we saw that it creates a lot of bottleneck and it, like a lot of researchers are doing a lot of IT work instead of doing research. So what we have done, we host a set of data sets that are already public. We just simplify the access to these data sets. So if you have, for example, a research project around genomics or medical imaging or EHR, look into our platform. You might be able to find data sets that would help you simplify the testing of the hypothesis process. Once the data is in the cloud, what can you do with it? And it depends really on what you want to do with it, right? At the end of the day, cloud is a collection of components, and you can build an application or a solution that meets your needs. Some examples I'll bring from what we see in the field from talking to customers or partners. Um, on the analytics, two, two buckets in this slide. Uh, on the left side, you see the analytics use cases. On the right side, kind of machine learning applications. So BigQuery is our enterprise data warehouse tool that can be used in a very versatile way to analyze huge quantities of data, so petabytes of information. I'll just give you one data point. So BigQuery is the tool that is used by Google to analyze search traffic patterns. Right? So if you think about the corpus of data that's behind search, this is a tool that can analyze petabyte scale without any constraints. Now, the way we see people using this in healthcare varies a lot by the nature of the application. For example, some folks must have flown into here. So you must have, you must have seen in the airport when they ask you, hey, who here has flexibility to stay and take a longer, like a later flight. We'll give you, let's say, a voucher for a hotel. You can see the city. Now, this happens because the airlines, they don't, want, they don't like to have empty seats in the airplane for obvious reasons. So they double book it. The problem is you sometimes in healthcare find similar resources that are very high precious commodity, like, for example, a MRI, MRI machine, or even like a spe specific expert, right? specific specialist. You prefer to overbook and have maybe the patient wait longer than having a slot that is not utilized. So we see customers that are using the data that they gather from different parts of their healthcare system to try and predict no-shows. Or another example I'll give you is something called procedure leakage. Leakage happens when a patient, for example, shows up and they do, they're, let's say, about to do a surgery. It's a planned surgery, so there is typically a pre-operative imaging. They will do this exploratory, make sure that, as, as Ben mentioned, you want to make sure that the, uh, the animal or the human in this case is capable to undergo the procedure, everything is fine. But then if you're like a large healthcare institution, you see that the patient chose to do the imaging in your institution, but then they chose to do the surgery somewhere else. And the way that economics of healthcare work, it's actually it might be the imaging procedure you might be doing at a cost but the surgery procedure is the one that your hospital actually makes revenue, right? So that's kind of the, the business side of, of healthcare. And then that's a problem, right? Because as a hospital, you need to better understand like what, what causes that? Like are your surgeons maybe providing different service? Like do you need to increase the cost of your imaging? Like this is type of business intelligence that you wanna get from the data that you're collecting from your system. So this is another example of analysis on large-scale data that you can do. De-identification. So the, th the thing I, I really liked about uh, like working with medical images data in the animal space is like you don't need to worry about PHI. So PHI stands for protector healthcare information. In my understanding is there is no HIPAA law for animal pictures, which is fun because you can take selfies with your patients. 
In the human world, it doesn't work that way. So you have to be, of course, very careful like what information is shared and collab like in collaborations, for example. If you have a large academic medical center, typically you have the clinical entity that sees patients, collects the data, and then you have the research part, right? Like these researchers are trying to increase the quality of the new, develop new procedures, develop new uh, operations, develop new diagnostic methods. And they use some of this data from the clinical side. But for this research, you have to be mindful of what data is used. So this de-identification process is very critical to enable research in institutions. Now, de-identification is a hard problem. I'll give you an example. Every time I present the tools that we have around the identification, I get the question, well, can your tool, for example, it was a very specific question that I got until we actually realized where it came from. Can your tool detect a serial number of a pacemaker in a CT? It's like, whoa, that's like very specific. It, it turns out it can, right? Because when you have a pacemaker, it has a unique serial number. That serial number comes in a CT image that scans the patient, and that is used to identify who that person is. Right, so that kind of look, okay, you didn't think about it, but the tool actually does work here. Now, the, the next question was like, can your tool detect a name of a patient written on a grain of rice in foreign language that was like worn by in her necklace? So this is a real case, they actually showed me the picture. Our tool didn't work well for this case, but so didn't the human operators or any other tools, right? So I'm bringing this example to mention that it's hard, like it's hard to, build tools that are working perfectly, but these tools are evolving because of the advanced technology and the AI that's kind of embedded in these tools. So we're making progress. And the benefit of using cloud-based tools is that they evolve without you having to deploy automatically. And of course, there are some questions around, okay, so how do you maintain version controls? And we have some thoughts about that we would love to share with you as well. Natural language processing. So this is a huge umbrella of tools and it really depends what you want to do there. And we have some research efforts in that space. Um, for example, I'll give you a couple of use cases just to stimulate thinking. Um, imagine a large healthcare provider that reviews thousands of patients every day. Now, when a radiologist writes a report, they typically look for the thing that the patient was referred for. Like for example, um, if the patient was referred for brain bleed inspection, the radiologist is not looking for cancer because that's the, what the physician was like telling him, hey, you should look for this. Um, in some cases, since you already have the person and you have the information in front of you, you might alert, say like, hey, you, you need to look into this because I wasn't looking for it, but it's, it's there in the data. So NLP is something that can be used as well as image analysis to try and detect these incidental findings or critical findings and help organizations implement certain protocols. Like for example, maybe you're looking for brain cancer and you wanna rule that out, that doesn't happen. But on the other hand, you do see there is like a, a bleed that is suspicious that you want to respond to within a few minutes because that might be life-threatening. So this is an example where NLP, NLP can play a role to identify what the radiologist or the doctor writes in their report and start a new, a new process inside your IT system. Labeling. So Ben was talking about the importance of labeling. Anytime you wanna train any kind of AI model, you need to basically teach it. Labeling is the way that you teach AI models uh, in a supervised learning kind of environment. We have a set of tools that enables you to label data. Um, and we also have published some interesting research on adjudication. Like if you think about it, let's say you want to detect kidney stones, just for a simple example. So one simplistic approach would be, well, have a like, set of images, show these set of images to a, a radiologist or someone who can label them effectively. Like basically, you could simplistically think like, okay, I show this image to one doctor and they would provide me the labels and that's good enough. In reality, what happens if you do that, you bias your model because you're basically encoding the brain of that one particular doctor. So you need to balance it by offering several opinions. And there is a way to do it in a way that is cost effective. The other example is, think about you have a labeling budget. So let's say you have only 1,000 pictures that you can label, but you have a pool of 10,000. Which thousand should you label? They're not all the same, right? Some of them might have more discriminatory power. So they basically what it means is that they have more signal to noise. So when you're about to train a model, 
you can get more insight from these thousand that will that from the bottom thousand. On the machine learning side of things, so AutoML, obviously, uh, this is a kind of a tool that allows you very quickly, without writing any code, to test out hypotheses to see how well your model performs. Some cases you might be able to use something like that produced by AutoML right off the bat. In some cases, you use it as an exploratory tool, right? You kind of gain some intuition. The data scientists in the audience would know that you have lots of different tools, and not depending on the type of job you have, you need to choose the right tool. What we see in practice is that customers are experimenting with different tools, like AutoML is kind of initial exploratory, super quick and super easy to try and, and understand like the problem and the dimension in which they should optimize. And sometimes they use additional tools, like cloud machine learning engine, which offers you a little bit more knobs, a little more control power, but requires a little bit more expertise on the machine learning and data science side. We are learning that one of the challenges in the healthcare space is that a lot of companies are building AI algorithms. And one of the challenges is like, how do you, is if, let's say if you're a physician, a radiologist for a medical imaging space, how do you evaluate these models? Somebody says that they have a model to detect the thoracic or skull or extremity versus another model. Like, how do you compare their quality, right? Right now, there is no standards for that. Or somebody says they have a model to detect lung nodules for cancer. Another model is doing the same. Which one is better? So we are building a tool um, that would be allowing you to evaluate and compare these different models and choose the right one for you. A couple of words on applications. Uh, we are very much embracing the open source world and kind of like we have a as Google, we have a very open DNA, and we want to enable people to use the tools that they already used, for, used to. And um, we have, on the healthcare space, in the medical imaging space, in the vi vision domain, we have invested in integrating some of these tools with our data backend. So what that means is that you can take one of these open source viewers, or you can take a, several, we have several commercial viewers through partners. We deliberately chose not to build our own viewer because we want to focus on the data platform and the cloud services that come with it and let the front end um, pieces to be driven by the applications and the market demand. Because oftentimes these things tend to be highly specific. For example, um, I just learned this morning about a very specific application in the wound management niche. So there is a very specific viewer, very specific workflow tool, and we want to give the tools to our partners to build for these very specific solutions because they have the domain expertise to do that the best. This is an example of open source de-identification tools. Because of the reasons I mentioned, de-identification is a hard problem to solve, but not only that, it's a hard problem to, let's say we, ha we have a solution today. You can try our DID solution. One question you might ask is like, well, how good are your solution? Right? Like, can you give me some specifications? The challenge with that is that in order to give you specifications, we need to agree on a data set. And that data set has to have PHI in it, protected health information. Now, for this, the, nature, the sensitive data, you cannot have a publicly facing data set with PHI. So the, the approach we took is we integrated existing open source tools with our data backend, and we offer these tools as well as our own tool to our users and customers and partners basically to test it out on your data set. So the idea is like here are three tools, two of them are open source, one of them is ours, see what works best. We're learning in practice that people are actually trying to do like a belt and suspenders kind of approach. So they might do actually all three in chain for, for, because they, they might be used to some of these tools from the past. Sometimes there is an issue of compliance because the, the tools that uh, open source tools that have been approved by their regulatory group inside. Sometimes our tool needs, takes a little longer to get approved, so they basically want to increase the level of confidence they have in DID solution. So this is like a couple of slides just to show you an example uh, of a, what we call a model browser or model explorer. This is just a mock at this point. This will be available around mid-year. Um, and this is a tool that would allow you to select an AI model to select a data set and apply the AI model on a data set and be able to compare or evaluate or reason about the results. So for example, think about you could 
take an AI model, you could feed it a data set, and you can generate an AUC curve, like the ones you've seen before for AutoML. We also published a set of tutorials that teach you how to, essentially, how to build your own AI models on top of medical imaging data. And uh, we have one that focuses on AutoML as a tool. We have one, if you want a little bit more flexibility, focused on cloud machine learning engine. Again, the right tool for the job is, is the name of the game here. So this is the link where you can find it. And it also, the example we chose to highlight in this case, very simple and not really of clinical use, but it touches through all the stations that you would need in order to develop a real application. So the example here uses a public data set that, um, for mammography, and it basically creates a classifier for breast density. You can see screenshots from AutoML um, work, so this basically allows you to evaluate the results and tune your model. You, you can see like, hey, my model's not good enough, I need to get more data. Like, a question we often get is like, how much data do I need in order to train a good model? And it's an empirical question, right? Because if your data, as I mentioned before, has a strong signal-to-noise ratio, you might need less data. But if you keep feeding it examples that are the same, then obviously you need much more of that. So um, the, the rule of thumb here, and Francisco, maybe keep me honest, what we're hearing in the medical imaging space is that for each class, you're trying to classify as between 1,000 and 10,000 samples. It's kind of a good starting point. So the advantage of deep learning is that it reduces the need for you to do feature engineering, but it comes at the expense of having to produce more data. In a world where we produce more data than what we ever knew what to do with before, I think it can be good news. The other way we're trying to optimize it, how do we help you use your labeling budget more effectively? Once you develop the model, how do you deploy it in the clinical workflow? So this is another piece, like how do you take the output of your AI predictions and bring it to the surface so that your physician can make use of it? We have some sample architectures about that. Come talk to us if this is of interest to you.